Good evening. It's good to see you giving me out this evening, if you will. Go ahead, open up your Bibles to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1. 2 Peter, chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 4 through 10 this evening. 2 Peter, chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 4 through 10. The Scripture talks a lot about falling away. As a matter of fact, we looked at that this Actually, just this morning, we looked at the subject of once saved, always saved. A lot of folks teach that in the religious world. But this afternoon, I want us to kind of continue our thoughts that we were going through this morning. And just notice the fact that there's actually a scripture that tells us what to do to avoid falling away. And so if you will, turn over to first, or sorry, 2 Peter chapter 4. I want you to notice... My apologies, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, beginning right there. I want you to notice what Peter has to say about this. He says in verse, uh, verse 4, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, Applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never fall. So from this thing, we see a phrase in here, as long as you practice these things, you shall never fall. But what are the things we're supposed to be practicing tonight? The title of our sermon this evening is, You Shall Never Fall If. And we'll go ahead and, I'm just not going to use the PowerPoint tonight since I wanted to bring it up and we lost it. So, ah, okay. There we go. So we're just going to go ahead and just notice some, some of these phrases. But what are these things we're supposed to be doing to avoid falling away? What is it the scripture is talking about here? It says as long as you practice these things, you shall never fall. What are the things we're supposed to be doing? Let's go ahead and look through these things. We're supposed to be adding to something. But what is that thing we're supposed to be adding to? Notice with me, if you will, back in verse 5. We're supposed to be adding to faith. That's in verse 5. And there's a lot of scriptures. I want to point this out before we go any further. There's a lot of scriptures that we can connect with each of these points. But this evening, what I want us to do is just focus mainly on the text. There may be a scripture here and there we may reference, but tonight I want us to focus mainly on what's being stated here in 2 Peter chapter 1. And so, when we look at this idea of faith, though, this is really the foundation. It, it comes from the Greek word pistis. Uh, Thayer's defines it as a strong or welcome conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah, from whom... Uh, from whom we uh, obtain eternal salvation to the kingdom of God. One who yields himself, just, just look at these two phrases that were in there. One who yields himself and obedience rendered to faith. You hear a lot of folks in the world, they talk about faith alone saves. You don't read about that in the Bible. Right here, even the very word faith. It doesn't mean it's supposed to be alone. Matter of fact, 1 Peter or excuse me, 2 Peter doesn't even talk about it being alone. It says this is something that needs to be growing. This is something that gets added to it. And you even see this even at uh, the end of Peter's later. Uh, we actually looked at this verse earlier this morning, but in 2 Peter 3, verse 18, it says to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so this isn't just a faith that comes about, stops there, and as we've talked about earlier this morning, once saved, always saved, and all of those doctrines. No, this is not what the Scripture is referring to when it talks about faith. It's something that needs to be added to. But what do you add to it? 
Well, the scripture tells us we add moral excellence. It's interesting. This is an interesting word in the Greek language. This, it's been translated several different things. I believe the King James Version says virtue is what we need to add to our faith. Strong's defines the word as manliness. And really the idea is moral courage here. Think about this idea of moral courage for a moment. We live in a very morally deficient world. We have so many different kinds of immorality going on in our society today. For one example, I mean, abortion is legal, homosexuality is prevalent, as well as many other sexual sins. You have increased hatred for fellow man. All of this going on. You have, you have social drinking. This is, we got a really morally deficient world. And sadly, some of these things sometimes interest the church. There's a congregation I was a member of years and years ago. Uh, they actually, it was interesting, they are teaching now that there's nothing wrong with being a homosexual. A church that was once viewed by many to be a sound congregation is teaching that. So let that sink in for a moment. That's horrible. That's terrible. We know from several other scriptures that homosexuality is wrong. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 states that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet, so many folks are starting to kind of get in on this, if you will, and basically say that there's nothing wrong with it. That's horrible to know brethren are actually going in that direction. It's a terrible thing. But when you think about moral courage, moral courage is really the idea of a willingness to stand for the truth no matter what. When you think about moral courage, this manliness, this virtue, this moral excellence, whatever your translation says, there's a lot of things that you've got to consider with it. This isn't just something that means nothing. The Bible doesn't use words that mean nothing. It's the idea of basically standing for the truth no matter what. Again, whether it be imprisonment, whether it be threat of false teaching as it's entering the church, it could be imprisonment, it could be well, other things. It could be getting, if you will, kicked out of the church in certain situations. These are horrible things that happen sometimes. But when you think about what we're supposed to be as Christians, you know, sometimes we're going to be referred to as the odd ones, as the weird people, because we'll be, we'll, we'll be standing for the truth. And we'll be saying no. We'll have that courage to say no when everyone else is saying yes. That's, what, that's the kind of virtue we need in our lives. That, this is what we need to be adding to our faith, a willingness to stand for the truth. But even going on beyond that, we have to add to that moral excellence then. We need to add to that, get this to work, knowledge. You know, you think about the fact that we're Commanded to grow in knowledge, as a matter of fact. We saw that in 2 Peter 3, verse 18, just a second ago. But here's the question, how do we grow? How does one grow in knowledge? How does one do that? Well, number one, we, do that through, we can do that through studying the Bible daily. We talked about that a little bit in our sermon this morning. How we need to be similar to the Bereans. Remember it says in Acts 17, 11, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, searching the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Shouldn't that be our mindset too? Another way we grow in knowledge is when we obey the Bible. Listen, we can be studying the Bible. We can be reading it over and over and over and over again. We can read the Bible ten, all the way through from cover to cover ten times in a year, and still be lacking in growth. 
If you're not obeying what the Bible has to say, if we're not following what God's Word says, we're not going to grow in knowledge. At least, not in a proper amount of knowledge that we could be growing in. If we're not actually applying it to our lives, if we're just reading it and just treating it like it's a fiction novel, if you will, like sadly so many people do today, then we're not going to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're not going to grow in knowledge at all of God's Word. But another way we can grow in knowledge is when we assemble with the saints. You know, sadly, so many times, I talked about it this morning, so many times, people just don't even want to come to evening worship service. They'd rather stay at home. How do you grow in the knowledge of how do you grow in this knowledge by just staying at home? You don't. There's a lack of growth there. When we're together, whether it be on Wednesdays, Sunday morning and evening, gospel meetings, when we're studying God's Word together, when we're listening to the preacher uh, give his sermon, and we're reading the Scriptures along with that and applying it to our lives, we grow in knowledge. We need to make the effort to be here every time the saints assemble. That's one, that's one other way we can grow in knowledge. But we're to even add on to that. How do you do that? How, what are we supposed to add on to that? Well, we're to add self-control. This is an interesting self-control. I believe the King James Version uses the word temperance. You know, sadly, many lack self-control in our society today. I've even, uh, excuse me, I've even seen it in Christians, I'm sorry to say. Sometimes they'll be super quick-tempered. I've known, uh, I know one brother who, uh, there was a time we were mowing some grass one time, and then his truck got scratched in, in the process, and, well, he started cursing. Flipped off right at the handle, if you will. That's not how brethren need to act. Yes, it's a stressful situation, but is that how God's people are supposed to act? Is that how God's people are supposed to talk? Definitely not. We talked about, in our Bible class this day, about rotten words a little bit. All those rotten words in Ephesians chapter 5, or chapter 4. Things that's corrupt speech, I believe the King James Version says. Is that how Christians are supposed to talk? Of course not. Another way some folks lack self-control. Sadly, many live for their lusts. I've known too many situations. I've known a situation, there was a deacon in the Lord's church. Years and years ago, I knew it. And he ended up stepping down from being a deacon and he moved to the Philippines. Well, when he was out in the Philippines, he cheated on his wife. Then we found out he was watching porn while he was a deacon. That's horrible. That's a very horrible thing to think about. But I'm telling you right now, there are Christians who live for their lusts. That should never be named among us, brethren. That's a horrible thing to see. Let that never be named among us here in Albany. But you continue on, and you see, we're, we're supposed to have escaped these things, these lusts anyways. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, we read that just a second ago, remember? It says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We're supposed to have escaped this. And sadly, many brethren just fall right back into it. It's a sad thing to see. Brethren, it's never a pretty sight when this happens. But then we're at, to add on to that self-control. We're to add to that perseverance. Uh, uh, the King James Version uh, says patience. And this is really a special kind of patience. A lot of folks, I'm sorry to say, don't know what the biblical way of patience is. 
and I've known folks to use it this way, that sometimes false teaching enters the church. And when it enters the church, or sometimes immorality even, and it enters the church, and they're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to go near that. I don't want to even touch that. I, I don't want to deal with that. I'm just going to kind of step over here and have patience with that. That's not what patience is. Patience does not mean to be passive or different. This is a patience which grows only in trial. It's not passive or indifferent. This is a patience that bears up under stress and strain, if you will. This means even when tempted to the point of, well, whether it be immorality or false teaching or imprisonment or even the death penalty in some countries for seeking to obey Christ to continue to stand for the truth. You know, many folks, they have that moral excellence we talked about just a second ago. They have that virtue, that moral courage, that false teaching enters the church, and they take a stand right then and there and say, I am going to stand against this error. And yet, those comes the next Sunday. They're still there. The people teaching that error, the people engaged in immorality, they're there the next Sunday. Then comes Wednesday, they're there. Then comes Sunday, then comes Wednesday, then comes Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday. You're tired of having to deal with it? I don't want to have to deal with it anymore. Comes the next Sunday, why, is this, why am I dealing with this? Over and over and over again. Think about that. Sadly, many folks are ready to stand for the truth from the get-go. And yet as things persist and continue and go on and you have to continue to stand for the truth, you finally just don't even feel like doing it anymore. This kind of perseverance, this special kind of patience, is going to continue even when it seems to just feel like it's never ending over and over and over again. This is the kind of perseverance we need as Christians. We need to be adding this to our faith. Let us continue to do so, brethren. But as we move on from there, we're to add even to perseverance. Perseverance is a, uh, as we see, the bearing up under stress and strain. Well, then you come to godliness. Godliness is an interesting word if you actually look at it. Uh, it, it actually, Strong's defines it as a reverence or respect for God. But really, when you actually think about what godliness is, it's really having the right attitude towards God. Sadly, I have known so many folks to have the wrong attitude towards God. Like, uh, let, let me just give this example. Maybe we come to worship, and we just kind of come down, and we're like, I guess we've got to get through this worship service. Another, another day, another Sunday. Another few dollars in the collection plate. That godliness right there? Is that a reverence and respect for God? Of course not. If we have godliness, we're going to strive to do what God has commanded us to do, and all of that with the right attitude. We need to have the right attitude towards God. If we don't, our focus is not in the right place. But you even move on from here. You're supposed to add to that godliness. To that godliness, we add brotherly kindness. And it's interesting, brotherly kindness here, it's actually one of the Greek words for love. Philadelphia, it's a love between brethren. This is the kind of love we need to have for one another and continue to keep with one another. This is something we need to have. We can show our love for brethren in many ways. 
Maybe visiting on members when they're in the hospital. Maybe visiting members when they're... Maybe they become shut-ins at home. Maybe they're in the nursing home. Just visiting them, see how they're doing. Send them a card even. Maybe some other situation. Someone who's just lost a loved one. Check on them, see how they're doing. Maybe there's an anniversary coming up for someone. And that anniversary is coming up, that wedding anniversary, and the special someone they married is no longer among us. Maybe checking in on them every once in a while. See how they're doing. Those are tough situations. I've never experienced one. But I know brethren who have. Those are always tough situations. I'm reminded of a song that we sometimes sing. Turn over in your song books to song number 643. If you will. We're not going to sing it, but I do want us to notice the words of this song. Number 643. Number 643, I want us to notice these words. It's a hymn entitled, God's Family. Just notice some of the, these verses here. First verse, we're part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us His own. Now we're part of the family that's on its way home. Verse 2, when a brother meets sorrow, we all feel his grief. When he's passed through the valley, we all feel relief. Together in sunshine, together in rain, together in victory through his precious name. Notice verse 3 now. And though some go before us, we'll all meet again just inside the city as we enter in. There'll be no more parting. With Jesus we'll be together forever. God's family. The chorus. And sometimes we laugh together. Sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. Brethren, we are the family of God. That's what First Timothy, Paul wrote Timothy in First uh, Timothy chapter, chapter 3 actually. He calls the church the household of God. That's the idea of a family. We read the words of this song, God's family in 643. Do you act like a part of that family? Something for us to all take to heart this evening. But then one last point before we conclude this evening. To that brotherly kindness then, we're to add love. Well, wait a minute here. Brotherly kindness is a, word, is a Greek word. But it means love. A love between brethren. So when we come to this word love, well, who are we supposed to love besides brethren? Well, number one, you love God. Some of you may remember 1 John chapter 5, uh, verses 2 and 3 talks about how we show our love for God when we keep His commandments. Sadly, many lack a love for God. I've seen it all too often times. And that lack shows when folks decide to fall away. We need to have a love for God, ladies and gentlemen. Otherwise, our focus is not in the right place. But as you continue from here, we also need to love fellow man. You know, one of the ways 
best ways I think we can show our love for fellow man is when we go out and when we evangelize and try to bring the lost to Christ. You think about uh, when we have gospel meetings. Well, why not start going throughout the streets of Alney and um, many of us live in Robinson and whatever other surrounding cities, or excuse me, not Robinson, uh, um, what, where was that? Uh, Newton, Newton. There's, and maybe even Robinson and uh, just the surrounding cities. Just going all throughout there. House to house, seeing who we can try and bring to Christ. You'd be showing your love for fellow man then, wouldn't you? What about not just gospel meetings? What about just inviting folks to come here in general? Maybe have an invitation card and just start handing those out to folks you might know at work. Maybe your next door neighbor. You'd be showing your love for them, wouldn't you? That's something we need to take to heart, ladies and gentlemen. We need to have a love for God and fellow man, as well as for the brethren. When we think about all these things this evening, once again, the Scripture tells us, makes it very clear in verse 10, as long as you practice these things, you shall never fall. Matter of fact, uh, the next verse uh, verse 8 actually talks about how these things need to be increasing. You see, you don't just get a little bit of these things and put them together and somehow you're never going to fall away. These things need to be increasing. Not just coming about and stopping right there. I can guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, in each one, every person that has ever fallen away throughout the history of the Lord's church, at least one of these things was forsaken from the start. When you forsake one, the entire thing comes tumbling down. Brethren, we need to continue to do these things. The Scripture tells us very clearly, right here, how to avoid falling away. And that's what we need to do. But you know, sometimes brethren do fall away. That's always a sad sight to see. But one of the greatest things is, about that is, God tells us exactly what to do when we do fall away. How do we get our hearts right with God when we do fall away? How do we do that? You know, I'm reminded of a man by the name of Simon we talked about this morning. That former sorcerer thinking he's going to get the ability to bestow spiritual gifts on folks. And when he had been doing that, and he had been doing his sorcery all those years, he comes to Christ, sees the gifts from uh, Peter and John being passed around. I want, I want that gift. Here's some money. Peter bluntly told him that his heart was not right before God. But you know, Peter didn't just stop there. He said in verse 22 what he needed to do to get his heart right with God. He said that he needed to repent and pray. A part of that prayer would be confession. 1 John 1, verse 9 tells us uh, very clearly, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If you're someone here tonight who has fallen away, why not return to God? You know, in the same book we've been looking at this evening, in 2 Peter, if you actually look at chapter 2, we'll borrow from there real quick this evening. 2 Peter chapter 2, I want you to notice verses 20 through 22. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, it describes the state of a person who, of a Christian who falls away. And it says in verse 20 of 2 Peter chapter 2, For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing 
returns to wallowing in the mire. A lot of folks ask, well, why does this say that it's worse? Why is it better to have never known the way of righteousness than, well, having known it to fall away? Why is it better to not know? Well, I want you to consider this. Here's a man who becomes a Christian. And he stays faithful for a short time, long time, but eventually falls away. Then he dies. Or the judgment day of Christ comes. He comes before the throne of Christ. The, the judgment seat of Christ. That's where 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 tells us we must all appear before. And then he comes before that judgment seat. And here's the words, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And then he goes from there to eternity and hell. Forever and ever. While he's there in eternity, he suffers the lake of fire forever and ever, going through all of that, knowing full well he did not have to go there. He had a chance at eternity. He was so close. And yet, threw it all away. The one hymn we sometimes sing uses the phrase, for a moment of joy at most. The Christian who falls away When he dies, if he's still in a fallen away state, if he still dies with his heart not right before the Lord, he goes through all of eternity knowing he had a chance. He was so close to eternal life. He was so close. And he threw it all away. And he lives with, and he has to go through that realization for all of eternity as he suffers. That's why it's worse to die a fallen away Christian, if you will, rather than someone who's never known the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's anyone here this evening who's fallen away, why not return? Why not come back to God? We just talked about how one returns to God. You can do that this evening. Perhaps you're someone who has never been a Christian. Maybe you've never decided to follow Jesus. Maybe you've never decided to become a follower of God. Why not do so this evening? You can do so by coming forward, believing that Jesus is the Son of God as we read about in John 3, verse 16. And through believing, repenting of our sins, that's a change of heart or change of mind. You see that in Acts 2, verse 38, Peter told those crowds on the day of Pentecost that they needed to repent. Confessing Jesus as Lord, Romans 10, verse 10, tells us, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth one confesses unto salvation. Ethiopian eunuch made that confession when he declared, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But you also got to be baptized. 1 Peter 3, verse 21 tells us that. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. We saw several other verses this morning. Acts 22, verse 16. Now why do you delay? Arise and be baptized. Mark 16, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And once you've been baptized, you need to continue in your walk with God. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4 talks about how we need to arise to walk in the newness of life. That's the idea of continuing to live faithfully. Revelation 2, verse 10 tells us, Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. I said the same phrase earlier this morning, but I'll say it again. If Jesus were to come right after the amen of the final prayer to this to our service this evening was, is said. Would you be ready? Would you be ready to meet God? Just let, 
Let that mull over in your mind for a moment. Would you be ready? If you don't think you're ready, if you think, you, or if you realize that your heart is not right before God, why not get it right this evening? If you need to return to God or come to God for the first time, why not do so? Get your heart right with God right now as we stand and sing.